I'm going to talk about some of the opportunities that have uh, come up between my group and other uh, Nexus teams that I'm really looking forward to uh, taking part in. Um, one thing that um, I think ties in very nicely to Nexus that we happen to be doing anyway is an upcoming Aspen Summer Physics Workshop. Um, I'm the project scientist for NEAD, which is the new NASA and then, uh, NSF uh, spec precise Doppler spectrograph going on the WIN telescope. Um, the idea is that we should be able to detect planets that have uh, radio velocity amplitudes of around 10 centimeters a second, which is to say that we think we have the instrumental and probably the statistical tools we need to measure radio velocities of stars down to that level. The question is whether the stars will behave. And so a lot of work has gone into this. Um, now, as stellar astronomers, we think of stars as point sources. And so we see disk integrated starlight. So we normally think of uh, an absorption line as just a single feature that moves back and forth when the star moves. Uh, heliophysicists have a different view of the sun as a resolved source. And so think of disk integrated light as the sum of many lines coming from many parts of the sun where the photosphere is moving at different velocities. Uh, and we astronomers are now at the point where we think that you know, we need to know that information. So uh, at Penn State, our Hubble fellow, Fabian Bastian, has been thinking about this hard and has put this uh, physics workshop together to combine stellar astrophysicists, instrumentationalists, and heliophysicists doing 3D models of the solar photosphere to get at whether this is even possible. Like, is there really enough information in a disk integrated line to retrieve 10 centimeter per second precision. And if there is, what signal to noise do you need um, by using realistic 3D simulations? And so um, there's a three week um, uh, summer workshop that's happening this year. And so I'm, I'm hoping that that's something that Nexus can support. Um, another uh, topic that's come up that actually flows out of this is that uh, Martin Aslan's group and others have been uh, modeling the solar photosphere um, properly and working out the radiative transfer to try and get at the photospheric abundances of the sun more precisely than before. And a big output of that work has been that the um, oxygen abundance has gone out of bounds of where it's allowed in the standard solar model. Um, uh, this is the second point here. So in some sense, that's broken helioseismology. So one point of view is that the abundances must be wrong. Um, another is that there must be an offsetting error somewhere in the solar models. And so I'd like to explore what, uh, what this new parameter space is and what assumptions that go into the standard solar model, other assumptions might be wrong. And one in particular that's been out of favor uh, recently, but I think maybe needs looking at again, is the idea that the sun may not have been born as a 1.0 solar mass star. Um, the standard solar model doesn't allow for it to have lost very much mass at all. But what we found is that if you make the sun have started at a slightly higher mass, and then you have high mass loss in the first billion years of its life, you build up more helium abundance in the core, and that changes the, astro the helioseismic signal in a direction that can be made to compensate for the new oxygen abundances. So it's possible we have more parameter space to play with, and that's important, because the amount of flux that a planet in the solar system receives goes as the fifth power of the stellar mass, two from the distance squared, and then three more from the luminosity out of the core. So this could be a component of the faint young sun paradox if we're allowed to have a slightly more massive um, early young sun. So that's something that I think we should explore now that we have more room to play with in the standard solar model. Um, that would also, uh, we also have, because of Kepler, or specifically because of K2, um, a lot of measurements of flare rates for st solar mass stars through time. That is, um, amazingly, almost all of the important benchmark open clusters in stellar astrophysics are on the ecliptic. And so K2 has observed essentially all of them. So we now have flare rates for solar type stars for clusters from a fraction of a billion years, uh, now recently all the way up to three billion years, and we just did N67, which is at four and a half billion years. So we have flare rates through time, real flare rates, not theoretical ones that we can now compare to the models that we've been hearing about uh, for what they should have been. Um, and so uh, there's now an NPP opportunity uh, to work uh, at Penn State on these problems, uh, working together uh, with Tony Del Genio's group uh, to use MESA to model the early sun and see how much mass loss were allowed, look at the flare rates in K2 with some of my stellar astrophysics collaborators to try and make sure that we're getting the high energy flux right, uh, and then applying these global climate models to look at the effects both uh, on early Earth and uh, also the Noachian on Mars uh, to see uh, how relevant that might be. 
Um, the other opportunity that's come up uh, has to do with these evaporating planets. So these so-called ultra short period planets, uh, periods less than one day, will occasionally exhibit very strange light curve uh, 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 eclipse shapes. So they're not symmetric like you're used to seeing. In most cases, uh, they look like what are basically cometary tails. Here's a few examples. They also have extremely variable transit depths, uh, which is pretty hard to explain, but it has to, must have to do with the fact that the intense installation on these stars, on these planets, is essentially causing them to evaporate before our eyes and not in a steady way, in some sort of stochastic way. Um, so this would just be a curiosity, except that what we're seeing here is presumably rocky bodies that are taking their guts and putting them right in front of a really bright light source and that's shining at us. And so, you know, we, we dream of being able to take representative samples even of the Earth's mantle, right? We, we argue about whether the mantle's well mixed and all this stuff. But here we have representative sam samples of exoplanets coming out uh, and being back, backlit by stars. So um, I'd like to know whether we can use JWST to actually probe not just the compositions, maybe the volatile compositions, perhaps even the mineralogies of the interiors of exoplanets, because there's no other way you could possibly do it. <laughs> so um, my uh, postdoc, Ming Zhao, who was the science PI of the, the, the grant that got us to be part of Nexus, uh, has been uh, putting together lists of these planets. Um, they come in a variety of different spectral types and magnitudes and a variety of different depths. Um, and uh, putting together a, he, he put together a habitable worlds proposal actually uh, to fund himself to do these pilot studies and ultimately propose for JWST time uh, to do these sorts of studies. Uh, unfortunately, um, uh, funding limitations and life on the soft money treadmill was just uh, too much for him. And so now he's making much more money than me as an entry level, level data scientist at the New York Times company. <laughs> Um, but uh, we're hoping that the Habitable Worlds proposal comes through and perhaps we can find someone else to work on that. Um, and this is also an opportunity for an NPP uh, postdoc as well, um, working at Penn State on these JWST observations, uh, but also working with Steve Desch's group, um, specifically on the mineralogical implications. Um, what questions can we answer about volatile delivery on these worlds, which after all may have once been habitable worlds, we don't know how they got in such short period orbits, but these are pretty low mass stars. They would have had to be close at some point to be habitable. Um, and uh, also to help us work out what features we're looking for and whether JWST can uh, detect them. Uh, and also there's this issue that um, they're, it's really close to the star. These effluents have presumably been altered in some way just by being evaporated or however it is they got off the surface of these planets. And so working with uh, uh, Neil Turner's group to um, make sure that we've got all but that worked out and we don't misinterpret what it is exactly that we're looking for. So that's two NPP opportunities that I'm, I'm really excited about. Um, we've also had some other collaborative activities with uh, uh, Nexus uh, members. Obviously, both of those opportunities I mentioned uh, intersect very nicely, like with Bill Moore's group and with uh, Vladimir's group. Uh, we had a really fruitful visit by Steve Desch to Penn State that sort of uh, gave rise to some of these uh, some of these ideas for collaborations that we're doing. Uh, we also contributed to the Fortney White Paper. Um, the idea there was that we need to know more about, um, uh, we need astrophysics laboratory data so that we can study atmospheres better. Uh, but we made the point that if you want to do 10 centimeter a second radial velocities, you have to understand the Earth's atmosphere, which contaminates all of our stellar spectra. We've used to just ignore it because it's such a tiny effect. We work where there are telluric lines, but there's no such place. The entire optical spectrum is filled with what have been called micro telluric lines, very, very low equivalents. You can't even see them in the spectra, but theoretically they're there. And sure enough, when we look where we know they must be, we see we get RV errors there. And many of the lines are not in any line list. We see telluric lines and we don't know what the origin is. And so we need better uh, lists there. Um, we sent uh, a new NSF graduate fellow, Jacob Lund, to the ASU Nexus Winter School. That was great. And so I was really, um, really pleased at that invitation. It spurred us to make sure he got to go. Uh, and then since I worked with Eric Ford on uh, our SETI paper that, that, that the press got wind of and uh, started the whole where's the flux uh, thing in the media, uh, that was, uh, I guess, technically a Nexus paper as well. So I, I felt I should mention it. Okay. Thanks. Okay, questions? 
I am not persuaded. Yeah. And that wasn't about flares. That was about just overall photometric stability. And um, Gabor Basri gave a very convincing talk to me that showed that um, if you take a realistic look of the actual distribution of photometric errors, uncertainties in Kepler, that there's nothing unusual about the sun. It looks like other four and a half, other slowly rotating G stars. Oh, well, uh, I am not convinced that Kepler validated the long-held position by many people that the sun is unusually quiet. And the other question I had was for the uh, evaporating bodies around the star. Mm -hmm. How do you know there are rocky bodies around cometary bodies? Um, how do you know their source? How do I know? Uh, if they were cometary, they would be extremely short-lived, I would think. And these are Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. These oh, things last for all four years. Okay. You see them in all four years of data. Yeah. Well, I was very intrigued by the, the hypothesis that the, the sun started uh, slightly heavier. So I was just wondering about the numbers. Are we talking about like a 10% increase? So um, you can't, percent? so, um, right. The, there was a paper on this five or 10 years ago using standard solar models. Uh, and all the canonical abundances and everything, the very well-tuned standard solar model, and concludes you couldn't get more than anywhere near like a, you couldn't get a percent or anything like that. Um, and so uh, I th think you can also pretty much rule out big things like 10%. Uh, I think that's still way out of bounds. Uh, I suspect we can't get more than about 1% just based on our really initial looks, but even 1% gives you 5% more flux at Earth and Mars, which might be that last step that you need on top of using the NOxes and stuff that Vladimir announced today to uh, really resolve it. I'm Yes, we are exploring whether you can get up to a percent or two. Oh, I said this one coming. <laughs> uh, so just a comment regarding the massless rays yeah. of the young sun. Yeah. Recent um, assumption or suggestion uh, was that CMEs may play a role in the young sun's uh, massless rays. Yes. In particular, uh, we showed that the, the, the massless rate can be very high, but the angular momentum loss rate can be quite smaller. So you can maintain this this uh, this stage of fast loss of mass for a while before you shut it down. All right. Because but the CMEs goes up. That's how you don't really use a So that would momentum. decouple the spin down problem from the mass loss problem, which is another constraint. There yeah. exists. Great. I, I want to make sure I get your citation before I leave. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Let's Great. Thanks. Yeah.